Genesis chapter 49. Again, today is Father's Day, and as I say every year for Father's Day and Mother's Day, you know, every one of us have a father and a mother. There's not one of us on this planet that doesn't have a father or a mother. And you can even make the case, if you would, that even Jesus had a father. He didn't have an earthly father, but he certainly had a father. And uh, so there's no, been no one that ever walked on the surface of planet Earth who didn't have a father. Oh, some of you sharp ones are thinking about Adam and Eve. Well, pastor, they didn't have a mother or a father. Well, if you will, God was, of course, their father because he created them. And so we can make the case that even Adam and Eve had a father, certainly not a mother, unless you want to use Mother Earth. That's a terrible term. Anyway, uh, so... Uh, but other than that, everybody else who walked on planet Earth had a father and a mother. And you know, God may not always bless us to be a father or a mother. God's plan is not for every male and female to be a mom or a dad to, to a child that they, that they produce. And my heart goes out to, to those of you that haven't had the privilege to be a a dad or a mom to little babies. Um, you know, there's very few things that are quite as special as being able to hold a little baby in your arms and then to watch them grow. And there's not many things that are as um, tugging at your heart and heartbreaking to see that little one grow up and eventually, uh, you know, have a life of their own. It's really hard. But this morning, I want you to think with me about the theme of dads, what are you going to leave behind? You know, the real answer to the question is, dads, what are you going to leave behind? It's he's going to leave behind everything. I mean, that's the reality. The reality is we don't take anything out of this world, no matter how rich, no matter how famous, no matter how uh, well-known we are. It's all, it all goes to nothing once we die goes to someone else. You know, I've been reading in my chronological Bible reading, and I'm in the life of King Solomon, and I just read this morning of Queen Sheba, the Queen of Sheba, not Queen Sheba, the Queen of Sheba, as she made that jaunt from Arabia up to Israel, to Jerusalem, to be able to see this one who she had heard about, this Solomon who exceeded, excelled in wisdom and excelled in riches and excelled in splendor. And you remember that little phrase that was said of, by her of Solomon that we have used in other cases? She said this, the half has not been told. She said, of all the things people said, now that I see it, wow, you're even that much richer. But you know what? Solomon also wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, he, uh, all of those things that I had didn't bring lasting joy. You know, so I want you to not think about what are you going to leave behind in the sense that you're going to leave everything behind. I want you to ask yourself this question, what am I really building into my children's lives what is it that I will leave behind in the life of my children and if you live long enough to your grandchildren? And frankly, like Mother's Day messages, these lessons are not just specifically to a dad. It just happens to be the context in chapter 49 of a dad blessing his children. In this case, it's Jacob blessing his 12 sons. But really, the lessons that we'll look at today could be used by any one of you as you think about the people that you have an influence over. If you have your Bible to Genesis 49, begin with me at verse 1. It says this, Then Jacob summoned his sons and said, Assemble yourselves that I may tell you what will befall you in the days to come. Gather together and shema here, O sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. You know, again, these are, in essence, these are Jacob's final words. My lesson on Thursday, I talked about assurance and how God can give us an assurance of His presence, an assurance of salvation. 
And we did that through some of the last words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 1. And we also turned to some of the other passages, Joshua's final words and David's final words, as it were, in Psalm 37, at least towards the end, because he said, I once was young and now I'm old. We looked at John the Apostle's words in 1 John, where John now is at probably around 90 years old, and he said, I know, or we know. And the last words of somebody are usually very important. And these final words of the father named Jacob to his 12 sons must have left an impact in their lives. Memories are an amazing thing, are they not? Memories can be really powerful. I mean, lasting memories. When I said to you about dads, what are we going to leave behind? Uh, let, me, let me give you nine things that we might be able to leave behind. We could leave behind riches, like Solomon. Position, power. I mean, Solomon left behind a lot of that. He left behind silver, and he left behind status, and he left behind strength. I mean, once again, some people are able to leave as an inheritance to their children and to their children's children a lot of things. Unfortunately, for some dads, what they leave behind is hurt, pain, shame. And rather than leaving behind riches, they leave behind debts. I mean, people... There are stories all the time of dads who, who had gambling problems or just kept getting into debt and kept spending and spending. And when they died, they left behind for their children a pile of debt rather than a pile of riches. What I want to talk about are things that would relate to these three words, legacy and faith and love. I mean, again, in these words of Jacob himself, I... Suspect he's reflecting what the psalmist said when he said in Psalm 90, we need to number our days. Number our days. You know, none of us have any idea when we're going to die. We don't know what today holds. We don't know what tomorrow holds. I, I, was, I had the privilege this morning to, to get on to Skype with uh, our our missionary Sammy and Maritza's church, their English speaking church, via a Skype meeting this morning, and and he gave me the opportunity to to share some things with them. And what I shared with them is from James chapter four, where James said, um, "Why do you have say I'm going to do this today or that tomorrow when you don't even know what tomorrow holds?" Reminded me again that. Maybe one of the lessons we need to learn from the last three plus months is we're not in control. <laughs> we, don't, we don't know what's coming tomorrow. On March the 15th, not one of us could have imagined what we were facing. On March the 16th, March the 17th, we thought it would be 14 days and we'd be back to normal. Well, it's been um, nearly 14 weeks and we're not back to normal. We have five, six people here this morning. I guess seven, including me. We're not normal. And I think we need to use that as a reminder of why Jacob found it so important to talk to his sons. I want to just pull three things out of the passage just by way of reminding ourselves of what we need to leave behind Look at verses 1 and 2 again, what I read, and look at the little phrase at the end of verse 1. What will befall you in the days to come? We need to give our children a view of the future. A view of the future. That doesn't mean that we can tell them what will happen tomorrow or, or what's going to happen in a week or a year or a month. We don't know that. My father died in 2001. 19 years ago. Well, he could have never imagined what life would be like in 2020. So when my dad would have tried to get me to think about the future, he couldn't have been specific, but he could talk to me about being prepared for the future. 
The days that come, that phrase is actually, we won't take time to look at it this morning, but that little phrase is actually a very uh, well-used phrase all throughout the Scripture. Often, especially as you get to the New Testament, it was a phrase that looked ahead to the coming of the Lord the second time. For us, it can also relate to the rapture. And the thing that this little phrase incorporates is that we need to bear our children for what may come in the future. Come all the way over to verse 22 because where we're going to spend our time this morning is in Jacob's word to Joseph. Um, you, you can spend time, if you'd like, looking back at what he says to the other uh, ten sons prior to what he says to Joseph, and then one verse to Benjamin, the twelfth son, you could go back and look at those. There's some really interesting things in these blessings that, that Jacob pours out on his sons. But I want you to follow with me. I'm going to read verses 22 to verse 26. It said this, Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a spring. Its branches run over a wall. The archers bitterly attacked him and shot at him and harassed him. But, he is, but his bow remained firm, and his arms were agile from the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. From the God of your father who helps you, and by the Almighty who blesses you with blessings of heaven above and blessings of the deep that lies beneath and blessings of the breasts of the womb, the blessings of your father, have surpassed the blessings of my ancestors, Jacob said, up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. May they be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of the one distinguished among his brothers. Jacob's words to Joseph. <laughs> you remember Jacob and his treatment of Joseph? Do you remember that? He always seemed to treat Joseph differently, right? He always had something just a little more for Joseph and the other brothers. Well, that's right here. What he says to Joseph is, is, is far and above and away higher than what he said to the other ten brothers, and even what he'll give that one little verse to his younger brother Benjamin. But I want you to zero in with me this morning on verse 23 as we think about preparing our children for the future. All of life is filled with suffering. Did you notice when I read it said the archers bitterly attacked him and shot at him and harassed him. I think sometimes we do our children a disfavor when we, when we raise them to think there is no pain in life. That there is no trouble in life. When we try to take away every obstacle in their life. There's been all kinds of terms used over the last number of years. One of them is a helicopter parent. The parent who's constantly you know, over top of their parent, I mean, of their child, excuse me. Sometimes parents, because they know the pain they lived with, they, they wanted to do everything they could to provide a safe place or, a, or a, a, a comfortable place. They didn't want their children to ever feel the pains of life. And actually, I think they did them a disservice. Life has pain. Okay, I get why society did away with teeter-totters, okay? Okay. I mean, I get it. I mean, I was a kid. And we all know what we did. We got on the teeter-totter. And when it was down here, what did we do? Just slipped off. Woo! Our poor little friend. Boom! Pain. I mean, I created it. I'm the first to say it. But, nope, do away with the teeter-totters. We don't want anybody to get hurt. Well, then they did away with the jungle gyms. And then they did away... I mean, there's hardly anything left. If you go out to the back of our church, we have a really nice um, play equipment for our daycare kids and our church kids. 
Do you know that we have to have, is it 18 inches or 24 inches of padding underneath there? I mean, you go to a park and, you know, they've got all that really expensive stuff you can bounce on because we don't want anybody to get hurt. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not asking to hurt your children. But we have done everything we can to shield them from pain so that the first time they actually do feel pain, the first time someone makes fun at them, the first time an archer shoots an arrow at them, the first time an enemy seems to come around them, they aren't sure how to handle it. Because we haven't prepared them for the hurtful kinds of people that they will encounter. Here, Jacob wanted to prepare Joseph and, yea, his, his children, of course, who, who he had already blessed, by the way, in, in chapter uh, 48, where, where uh, uh, Manasseh and Ephraim got Joseph's blessing, and, but now, I mean, excuse me, Jacob's blessing, but now we see that and he said, you need to be prepared. There are going to be archers that will shoot at you bitterly. Wait a minute. Let, wait, let's think about something. Seems like that already happened in Joseph's life, Joseph's life, and it also seems like it happened from the ten guys just before these verses. Am I not right? I mean, Joseph is the leader of Egypt, but he wouldn't have been there had it not been for what these ten brothers had done to him years earlier. Now, of course. For Joseph, we all know the end of the story. He, he never became embittered. He kept his focus on the Lord. That's why in chapter 50, when his brothers got really nervous after dad passed away, Joseph made that tremendous statement, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. But I think we need to prepare our children for the difficult days. Hey, frankly... Maybe that's why some people aren't handling the whole coronavirus, COVID, stay at home as well as they could because they thought life was always going to be fun. They thought it would always be comfortable. In fact, I'm, my own opinion is I'm convinced that that is part of the problem. You've got some people out there who were never trained. They were never prepared for a hard life. And so now they don't know what to do. I think we need to prepare our children for that. Look at that word harassed. Again, it just means they're hostile at them. It, actually, it can mean a grudge. That's why you need to keep reading later into chapter 50, though most of you know exactly where it's coming. I mean, that's what the... At, at chapter 50 and verse 15, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph bears a grudge against us? The reality is they bore a grudge against Joseph. That's why they sold him. That's why they wanted to kill him, some of his brothers. There are some people who will come at us and attack us. And I think we need to prepare our children for that possibility. We need to prepare our children that when difficult times come, our focus is going to be on the Lord. And I think that's exactly what Jacob is doing. But there's a second thing, and I need you to not only think about preparing your children with a view to the future, I think you need to help them understand a view of life, a life of God's blessings. You know, jump down to verse 25, if you would, in 26. There are six times that the word bless or blessing is used. In those few verses, I, I read them with blessings from God the Almighty blesses you, blessings from heaven, blessings from the deep, blessings from the womb, blessings of your Father, blessings of the surpassing the blessings of the ancestors. I mean... I think we also, not only a view to the future, that is a relationship to sometimes suffering that may come, give them a view of life of what God can give them. The blessings that God can provide. Look at verse 22. Look at the blessing that you see there. He said Joseph will be a fruitful bough. A fruitful bough in the spring. Kind of reminds me of Psalm 1. 
Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the godly, nor stands in the way of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight will be in the law of the Lord, and he'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, and it'll bring forth its fruit in its season. We need to help our children understand that God can bring a blessing to their life to a place where they would be fruitful. Notice the second part, it said, and its branches run over the wall. If you have any kind of a handy-dandy electronic device or even if you have some of your old paper books, I would encourage you, you might look up those words because the word bow is the word son and the word branches is the word daughter. It's kind of interesting how, the, how Jacob frames those words. But whatever can be said about it, it talks about a, a, a blessing of God to where Joseph and his, and his uh, successors, as it were, will have God's blessing of fruitfulness. Again, jump down there to verse 25 with blessings from heaven above. I mean, I think that might be something awfully practical, like, for instance, rain. If there's any one thing that the people in the Middle East desperately need in order to be a fruitful vine is to have water, right? I mean, it's an arid area. you got to have water. That's why the Jews have... Um, they, they, they are the ones that invented, as far as I know, drip irrigation. They created it. They developed it because they needed to turn this wasteland of a desert into something that would be fruitful and they knew they couldn't just waste the water and so they created the drip irrigation and now you drive down the very center of the country out in this absolutely hot desert area and here are these beautiful green lush trees and, and other fruitful vines and it's all because they provided water. I think part of what Jacob is saying here is that God will bless you from heaven above. He'll give you rain for your crops. Then he said, and from the deep that lies beneath, I suspect that might be an actual pointing to things like streams and wells where again, water was involved. We need to help our children to understand where our blessings come from. We've sang for years in our churches, praise God from whom all blessings flow. We used to always sing that at... Um, at, at, at offering time, back when I was young. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him above all ye heavenly hosts. Praise Him, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I mean, we need to help them understand. But then he said, from the breasts of the womb. I think again, now he's not talking about water from heaven or the water from beneath, but children, that your families would be blessed. A view of life that says it's God who brings us blessings. But I want us to move to the fact, this is where I really want to spend some time. Oh, we need to get them to understand that there may be in their future suffering, and we need to help them understand that, that God may send His blessing, but it all is dependent on the third one, which is they need to have a proper view of who God is. As I read the passage, did you notice there are no less than five names for God? Did you notice that? Let's look at them just real briefly. From the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. The mighty one of Jacob. I mean, again... After we move out of this chapter, once we move into Exodus and beyond, we will often hear about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <laughs> the mighty one of Jacob. I need you to turn with me to the book of Isaiah. Would you do that with me? Just real quickly, I know you're sitting there at home and, and you can't, you don't, I can't see you. I don't have a romper room, you know, mirror, so I don't know, but I would love for you to turn there. Look at Isaiah chapter 1, jump in at verse 24. 
He said, therefore, the Lord God of hosts, the mighty one of Israel. Well, you know that Israel is the other name for Jacob. So really, you could say in this verse, therefore, the Lord God of hosts, the mighty one of Jacob declares, ah, I will be relieved and so on. The mighty one of Jacob. You're still in Isaiah. Turn with me to to chapter 49. Come with me to chapter 49. Again, the cha- I tell you all the time, you need to spend time in Isaiah 40 to 48. But look at chapter 49. In chapter 49, jump down to verse 26. And it says, I will feed your oppressors with their own flesh, and they will become drunk with their own blood as with sweet wine. And all flesh will know that I, Jehovah, am your Savior your Redeemer, here it is, the Mighty One of Jacob. The Mighty One of Jacob. Just keep going. Go to chapter 60. Go to chapter 60 and verse 16. And you will suck also the milk of nations and suck the breasts of kings. Then you will know that I, Jehovah, am your Savior, your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. We need to help our children to understand that God is the mighty one of Jacob, that He's the powerful one. No matter how much power and authority humans have across this country, no matter how how in control some political leader, some dictator even, may feel that they are and have, they are nothing compared to the mighty one of Jacob. I don't know about anybody else, but I've had to keep reminding myself of that over these last 14 weeks or whatever it's been. I mean, I just have to keep saying, Lord, I I know that you can turn the hearts of the kings and, and I know that you have a plan and I know that you're still the mighty one of Jacob, but God, it just sure seems like there's some people that think they're in control. Well, they may be in control for a short time. But I want people to understand that He is the Mighty One. Do you remember the psalmist when he said He is mighty to save? Remember that? We look at our world and I I, I think again, I think there are times we we look out and it's gotten so bad and so just so depraved and all of that. We maybe we're giving up hope in this in, in salvation. Maybe we're giving up hope in redemption. Maybe we think We've now moved beyond such a thing. We haven't. The most wicked and vile person can still be saved. And we as dads need to help our children to understand that. Come back to Genesis 49 quickly. Let's look at the second name that is in our, is in our, is in our verses and a name that I don't even have to spend any time on really, right? He's our shepherd. I mean, your mind immediately went to where? One of you four that are sitting here, where'd your mind go? Exactly. Psalm 23. They all got it right, by the way. Psalm 23. Exactly. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The shepherd of Israel. Psalm 100 and verse 3. The sheep of His pasture like i say i don't have to do a whole lot of work helping you to understand how desperately we need a shepherd i mean it's used often throughout scripture but then again i jump ahead if your mind didn't go to psalm 23 it might have gone to a new testament gospel john 10 i'm the good shepherd I mean, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Oh, we need to help our children to understand they can have God as their shepherd after they've made God their Savior. We don't get to have Jesus as our shepherd if He's not our Savior. I think again, that's why so often I think people have missed that. They want... They want Jesus to be their provider. They want Jesus to be their healer. They want Jesus to be their 
their friend, and yet they've never made Him their Savior. You have to bow your knee in humility to the Lord Jesus Christ as the holy and pure Son of God who died on a cross for lost sinners. And once He is your Savior, then He's your shepherd. And if your children know the Lord is their Savior, as you raise them and they trust Christ as Savior, you need to help them to understand they have a shepherd. Because they're going to run into trouble. <laughs> they're going to be attacked by the enemy. You know, all those verses, so many verses in the, in the Old and New Testament deal with that, that, that as sheep were attacked by the wolves. Even in John 10, remember he said, he said the false shepherd only comes to kill and to destroy. I mean, steal, kill, and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. Oh, we need to help our children to understand there is a shepherd of our souls who sticks closer than a brother. Look at the third word. Again, I don't have to do a whole lot of work because we just spent time on that word in our study in Matthew. It said, he said to Joseph, oh, by the way, the stone of Israel, the rock of Israel. I mean, I get it in Genesis 49. That wasn't quite as well understood as we have it. Psalm 118 and other verses talk about the stone that was rejected. And Jesus, when He said, Thou art the rock, Peter, and upon this rock. And I said then, I, I suspect at least there's the possibility that that rock mentioned in Matthew 16 was actually a reference to Himself as the rock of God. Here we have a stone of Israel. We have something that we can have stability in. Again, the book of Isaiah speaks about it. It uses that term. I want you to just go back. I said in chapter 48 was, the, was Jacob talking to Joseph's sons. Look at it in verse 15. Then he blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from evil and so on. Jacob said, God is my shepherd. David's words in Psalm 23 are not so unique. Our children need to understand that God can be our shepherd. He guide us and lead us, and then He's our rock, our stone of remember, the stone of Israel, the one that has stability and strength and security. But there's a fourth word, a fourth name of God, and it says in verse 25, "From the God of your Father." Please notice it's singular. The God of your Father. We will come to use a term. The Old Testament will come to use a term. The God of our fathers. Plural. But this is the God of your Father. You understand what Jacob is saying here is that he himself had a personal relationship with the God of heaven. See, dads, let me just talk to you for a minute. And I would frankly talk to you even if you're not a dad, but listen... You cannot legitimately and, and faithfully tell your children about who God is unless you know Him. The God of your Father. When Joseph heard those words, he knew exactly what he was talking about. Not some generic term, the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No! A personal word from his own dad. Our children need to see a reality of a walk with God in our lives. The God of your Father. Again, that's why I love to point out in Psalm 23, the Lord is the shepherd. Is that what it says? It's not what it says. The Lord is my shepherd. Oh, listen, I get it. I mean, if we really wanted, we could talk a lot about Jacob and the deceiver and 
some of that stuff. I mean, nobody in this list, including Joseph himself, is is 100% pure. No, none of us are. But Jacob understood something. I mean, the God of your father who helps you. Then there's the last name. The God he called Almighty. We know that the name God Almighty, El Shaddai, You've heard me say this often, but I'll say it again. This particular use here is just the word Shaddai. And by Shaddai, who blesses you, once again, Shaddai has the idea of the one who nourishes us. In fact, in fact, it comes from the same root as breast. And I think it's interesting if you connect it back up uh, I mean, excuse me, down to the to later in verse 25 where he says the breasts and of the womb. That it wouldn't have it, it would not have been missed on the Hebrew reader. God is our provider, our our nourisher, our strengthener. He is all I need. Again, I've often said this, and I'll just say it again. To me, the God El Shaddai, or in here is Shaddai, it just simply then says, God is enough. God is enough. The reason I picked this up was because I wanted to reference the words that Pastor Daniel referenced when we started to sing, but Psalm 62, this is what you sang. My soul finds rest in God alone. Listen, my rock and my salvation. A fortress strong against my foes. And I will not be shaken. Though lips may bless and hearts may curse and lies like arrows pierce me, I'll fix my heart on righteousness. I'll look to Him who hears me. Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. My delight and my reward. Everlasting. Never failing. My Redeemer. My God. Find rest, my soul, in God alone amid the world's temptation. When evil seeks to take a hold, I'll cling to my salvation. Though riches come and riches go, don't set your heart upon them. The fields of hope in which I sow are harvested in heaven. Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. My delight and my reward. Everlasting, never failing, my Redeemer. I'll set my gaze on God alone and trust in Him completely. With every day pour out my soul and He will prove His mercy. Though life is but a fleeting breath, a sigh too brief to measure. My King has crushed the curse of death and I am His forever. You didn't realize when you were reading, singing those words, you didn't realize where we were going. But I did. And I couldn't help but think what a perfect song. Oh, how many times have I said it over the last 40 years how God puts things together. And it was no mistake this song was chosen for this service today. No mistake. Every word virtually in this song just says what I've been saying. We need to prepare our children for the difficulties, the lies, as this song said, the hearts that may curse, the arrows. Arrows! That's exactly what our verse says. The archers... Archers shoot arrows, by the way. The arrows that pierce me. Again, the rock of our salvation. I mean, oh, if you, I mean, again, if you weren't paying much attention when you were singing, you need to go back and look at those words. You need to go back and, and sing them to yourself again. Because they are absolutely what we are talking about. Of course, then it led into our final song, an old hymn that we are all so familiar with. It is well with my soul. 
I've got Heidi sitting here in front of me, and we remember where we were a year, a year ago, right? We were all in Israel a year ago. Had you fallen yet? I was just thinking about that. I don't think so. Not yet, huh? But um, one of the great places I love to take people to is a place called the American Colony. It was started by a guy named Horatio Spaford. No, oh, look at that. The guy who wrote the song. And he wrote that song. And on, the, on, the, uh, on, the, on a, a, a board there is the handwritten copy of this song. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well, it is well with my soul. I mean, all of you, I'm sure, know the history of this story of how Horatio Spaford lost everything in the fire of Chicago, and then his wife and children were in a, 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 a shipwreck out in the middle of the sea, and his children died, and she wrote a, a, um, a telegram that said, Saved Alone, and then as he wrote this hymn, I mean, again, you can just see it all, like sea billows roll. We need to raise our children to think into the future of who is taking them into the future. But then again, it's for all of us. Every one of us, a mom, a dad, a brother, a sister, a son or a daughter, it does, I mean, again, it doesn't matter what our lot in life is. We need to help people to understand that we can walk with that God as our mighty one, as our shepherd, as our rock, as our our God, the God of our Father, and as Shaddai, the one who nourishes, the one who is enough. We'll end today with the song we ended last week with this song about my worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross, you realize that we would never have redemption. We would never have salvation if it wasn't for what Jesus suffered on the cross. When you think about that, say to yourself, Lord, may then I respond correctly. Let's pray. Father, I thank You. I thank You that even today, you are to us our Father. May we never forget that. Lord, may You so challenge our hearts, cause us to love You more, cause us to love one another more, build within us, Lord, a, a reality that no matter what we face, the archers or the harassers or the Sanballat and Tobias, as it were, who come against our life and our soul that You have promised that You would bring Your blessing. Father, I just pray that today, on this Father's Day, whether I'm a father or not, whether a person is listening and they may or may not get to have that title, Oh, Father, may they know that You are their Father. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.